Well, good morning or good afternoon, depending on what side of the country you're joining us on. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, we're super excited to uh, give our, our beginning of the year economic update. Uh, we're calling it our MFA economic update, profitability growth in 2022. Uh, so thank you very much for joining us. We're excited to have everyone here. Um, joining me today is our Chief Investment Officer, Managing Director, Craig Cecilia. Craig oversees all of our investment portfolios, has been our, our Chief Economist and uh, predictor of interest rates direction and, and been very, very accurate at it for a number of years and uh, has been very helpful with our clients uh, continuing to do very well in these difficult, low interest rate environments. And uh, I know we're all going to be wanting to ask Craig quite a bit about inflation and where yields are going in bonds and uh, what's going to happen in this environment. So we're super excited. Craig does lead our investment advisory team. And uh, also we're fortunate we have a, a great leaders and team members on our asset liability management team and our valuation area. So uh, lots of lots of great people in our three main groups of our organization. Uh, really glad that a number of us, a number of them are joining us uh, virtually on this call today also. So thank you all for being with us. Today, uh, we're gonna go through our presentation. Please feel free to ask any questions along the way or at the end. Uh, depending on the question, the timing, we may pause and answer it during the presentation, or we may answer it at the end. If you move your mouse around on your screen, you'll see that the little Q&A button there, uh, please feel free to type that in and we'll be alerted of your question. Today's webinar will be recorded. If you'd like to share it with your team, preach out, please reach out to your MFA advisor or go to our YouTube channel and you'll be able to get a copy of uh, this presentation to share with your organization. So with that, um, we have an exciting economic update and it's gonna tie in with the profitability that we're gonna go into in the next slide here. Uh, we're gonna talk a little about COVID, interest rates, inflation, the stock market, housing, auto sales, employment, and what I call the result is, is our projection, projections and, and where we're going and why. So really exciting stuff, important in the economy. Um, the second component here we're gonna get into and tie really our first part of our presentation into is profitability growth in 2022. Uh, we're gonna look at 10 points of profitability that we think everyone should be looking at. We're also gonna talk a little about CISA, we'll call it the 11th point, not really a point of profitability, but something important to be working on implementing. Uh, so with that, um, uh, we'll kick stuff off again. Craig, thank you for joining me. Yep. And thank you for having me. I appreciate everybody being here and listening in. And, and this is always the most exciting thing to talk about is COVID at the beginning of any presentation, right? <laughs> yeah, it's on every, everybody's mind, right? <laughs> yeah, but I remember going to business school and they said, when you get a pandemic, this is what you do. So we, we've all gone back to that pandemic playbook that we learned about, Um you know, as, as we, we just a little bit about it, we are in a substantial increase of COVID cases right now. Um, the positive out of any of this is that the, the Omicron variant is is not as painful, not as, as deadly as it appears the previous variants have been, uh, but the numbers are staggering. Uh, we're seeing right now that uh, there's been estimations that about 20% of Americans have already had or have the Omicron variant as we speak. Um, you got to look here. This goes back to the beginning. Uh, we've never seen case counts like this. We're talking about a million, million two cases reported in a day. We actually got all the way up to about a million and five reported in one day. Some huge numbers here. So this is going to have a little effect on the economy. Um, things are going to slow down. People are going to maybe not travel as much. We're seeing some of the travel problems out there today, but we're probably going to see a little bit of a slowdown resulting from this. Is that something you see coming up, Craig, because of this growth in the, the, the COVID variant? Yeah, I really do. I, I don't see it necessarily from a uh, business standpoint, but from a consumer standpoint, I, I don't want to say there's two different schools of thought process where it's uh, people are saying, hey, I'm, I'm you know, vaccinated. I'm not having to worry about getting infected. And if I do, there's some milder symptoms with this whole thing versus somebody that is treating it with respect to it's a virus. I'm going to really reduce my activities, my spending, my travel and whatnot. Uh, so there is, there is two different schools. There's not a right one and a wrong one, as we all know, uh, but it is impacting a lot of people's minds and habits as well as businesses and how they're running their institutions. And so I think this year is going to be really interesting as we experience and monitor uh, the uh, infections. Yeah, it's going to be an interesting one. That's uh, not boring. 
so, so with that, we get into where we are with interest rates and um, uh, the yield curve. One of the, the great important things in our industry, as everyone remembers, our, our deposits are based off of the short end of the yield curve and our, our loans are, are based off usually kind of the belly of the curve, the three to five year time frame, and then mortgages out at the 10 year time frame. Um, Craig, the shape of this yield curve has changed quite significantly here. Uh, just looking at the, we've been comparing back to December of 2012 for years now. Um, and we've been all over that line up and down, but it's been a pretty big move here in the past uh, couple of months. Yeah, I love looking at the yield curve, as you know, and and the reason being is the treasury curve is intuitive. Uh, it's almost like a living, breathing animal, if you will, and it is a good indicator of what's going on currently in the economy, as well as what's expected to actually happen in the economy. And uh, really taking a look at the red line, which is today, and how it's come up like a hump and the belly, as you use that term, that three to five years really come up quite a bit from the beginning of 13 or end of 12. It's almost 100 basis points in those terms, whereas the 10 years only up 15, the three month only nine. So we've had a definite change. We're steepening on the short end, flattening on the long end. And the reason I spend a little bit of time talking about that change in shape, it does segue into what are expectations. And right now, as we look at and we'll talk about later and what the Fed expectations are uh, for raising interest rates and some other uh, monetary policy actions, uh, the, the long end where it's flattening out a little bit, they're not necessarily buying into we're, we're taking off. And so we're seeing that tenure being a little stubborn, if you will, and kind of hanging in there. Uh, we do expect seeing some continued upward pressure on it, uh, but it is telling us a little bit about if it's not going to be run away with respect to the growth of our economy or inflation numbers coming up over the next you know, several quarters. Yeah, some people may call this a bear steep steepener where we're seeing short end curve come up as interest rates are coming up and then the Fed may put us into a recession. That would be one of the outcomes potentially. And, and, and we'll look at some history here in a bit, not saying that as our outcome, but that's one of the theories that, that come from this. And so uh, that's a, some great points. You know, as we, we look here at the next slide, it's it's my favorite as those of you who've heard me speak. I, I love this slide. I always say that over and over again. And it's important here. The black dotted line is the 10-year treasury. Uh, the blue solid line is the two-year treasury, and the red data line is the Fed funds rate. We're going back from 2002 until today. And why that's important there, we went through the rate increase here uh, with the financial crisis, breaking everything, and then we came crashing down. And as we went farther out, we came back up as the economy was recovering, and then we came crashing down because of COVID. Um, that two-year treasury has definitely got an interesting uh, angle to it there, the hockey stick change, I might call that. <laughs> Yeah, it's a big change there. And I love how things happen so quickly because yesterday I was going to order a blue car and today I'm going to order uh, a yellow car. And tomorrow I probably won't order any car at all because it's way too expensive, right? Things change quickly. But what I really like to look at sometimes on this as well is the dotted black line. And as we look back and think about the last decade and a half, or two decades, where were we expecting our economy to be taking it off? You know, 2009, 2013, 2016, where you have that increase in that 10 year yield and, you know, where it actually stalled. Uh, you know, we've really had a big stall, obviously, at the end of 2019, but for very different reasons with the pandemic. So it'll be interesting to see how this year, with respect to that same anticipation we've had four or so times over the last decade of things taking off. You know, it's interesting. You talk about the black dotted line, and here's a detailed look of the black dotted line here, which is the 10-year treasury. And, um, you know, fits and starts, what one may call it, as we look back, we get these big kicks up, and then we, we come back down. And, and so I think your, your point is well taken. Um, things have definitely moved, and, and I don't know how you're going to buy a car when you can't buy cars because you can't order them right now, but that's a whole other <laughs> sidebar conversation. Uh, but we, we have seen this, and what we do see is there is quite a bit of volatility, and, and, and news goes one direction, then news changes and comes back down a little bit. 
Yeah, I like looking at this curve as well, because it does isolate our conversations to that 10 year and things that are t t uh, priced off of the 10 year, whether it's mortgage rates or commercial lending or some consumer type of stuff. And, uh, with, you know, that's all going to be impacted as we see these rates rise and as we ex expectations are for the 10 year to go a little bit higher as well. Well, this is always fun to note here. Since 2006, the average has been a 2.62 on the 10 year treasury. We're at 185 today, 186, and the high was a 513. So that might give everyone a little bit of indication of, of the realm of where we could go. And I don't think the average is going to change much, but I'm not seeing this go to 6% by any means, but you know, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about projections in a few slides. Um, but just something to keep in mind with everyone when thinking about raising higher interest rates, they usually don't move as fast as what the talking heads on TV ex expect. I thought the Talking Heads was a music group myself, but I not think a they producer. Were, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, with that, um, a little bit shorter term things here, although that we have a long term picture of Fed funds, which we just saw a couple slides ago. Uh, the Fed is currently predicting now, or the, sorry, the Fed funds futures are currently predicting four 25 basis point increases over uh, 2022. Um, what are your thoughts on that, Craig? Well, the uh, it's interesting to me. December 15th, which we have on here, is where we did really, they did release their minutes and they were really took a big hawkish stance or tone, if you will. And what that means is, is their willingness to accept that we're having inflation, some growth, and they don't want it to become overheated. Uh, and, and you're right, there's of the eight meetings that they have throughout the year, the markets are expecting for rate increases. Um, you know, the other things that the Fed was talking about with their rate increases are the, their willingness to uh, accelerate the asset purchase program, the shrinking of the balance sheet is what they're kind of looking at doing as well. And um, I do believe that they're going to be raising rates of three is a great number for you know, that's what the markets are thinking. It might be a little aggressive, in my opinion, at this moment. Uh, but I do see that there is a couple of Fed governors that actually said, hey, five can't be out of the realm of thinking about just depending on what economic and uh, happens economically throughout mm -hmm. 2022. You know, it's, it's interesting. Yeah, that, that usually the, the Fed funds futures are the right direction, but never the right magnitude. And, and so I think here three to four is probably a good indicator for people to plan. I get excited when I see this. I get excited when I see this because we've been in this difficult environment. If we go back to that yield curve really quick, just to, to add in here, um, you know, our loan yields have been suffering. And right now we're seeing substantially higher loan yields that are going to come from this. We're also going to see substantially higher investment yields that are going to come from this. And, and to me, that's really exciting because that's going to help out the earnings of all, everyone on the call, the institutions on this call. So the Fed raising rates here is a good thing. We should all be happy about it, embrace it. Um, you know, so I'm, I'm pretty excited here. Absolutely. That goes hand in hand is, is the correlation between higher rates, inflation and liquidity and the Fed's uh, actions that they're, the market, the world are anticipating is to reduce a little bit of that, that liquidity as well. Uh, but I love it. You got to lend into this market and really have your programs and uh, relationships really fine tuned to make sure that we can uh, book some of these higher earning assets as we experience the higher rate environment. Yeah, there's, well, there's some great conversation on loans in a little bit here, uh, but it is is exciting to me. And I'm taking my excitement and tempering it a little bit. I'm going to tell a little story here and then and want to get your insight. But uh, this is the topic that I hear uh, every day, multiple times a day. What's going on with inflation and what's going to happen to yields? And, and, and we're going to go through our predictions on yields. Um, but here's how you get inflation. You know, a two-step process. Number one, you give out cash to everyone. You, you hand out money hand out, you know, as fast as you possibly can. And in 2020, we had five years of monetary growth. This is M2 money supply, skyrocketed with all the government programs. So this is step one still. Think about the program, the 2.2 trillion CARES Act, the billion, a trillion dollars CAA Act, 1.9 trillion ARP Act. And I, I love all these acronyms. The infrastructure bill may just be punted now and um, that might not be there, but the asset purchase program is there too, where it's putting money into the, the system too. And so we're talking about five, six billion trillion dollars, excuse me, got to remember the T, worth of activity being put out there. And then this continues. A lot of the payroll programs really gave businesses a lot of cash. So step one is give everyone cash. 
then step two is break the supply chain. And this is where we've done some really good shooting ourselves in the foot, but there's also some other things. You know, COVID has caused some employment problems. Um, one would say maybe we have a bad uh, policy of immigration in our country, not giving people social security numbers to work. Um, but we have a lot of people that have moved up. There's a lot of people who have left farm working and, and truck working uh, as jobs. People moved up from maybe working at a fast food restaurant to a fine dining restaurant. And we're missing a lot of people now to fill these back, these, these jobs, backfill these jobs. At the same point, the government's done some pretty difficult things. Uh, electronic truck logs. Truck drivers can't drive more than eight hours a day. I think I read the average is about 14 they were driving. Um, so we're now seeing some, some backlogs because of that. Diesel prices, gasoline prices. When we come out as a country against drilling our own, for our own oil, there's an, a, a response to that. Um, some COVID work stoppages. I, I still laugh when our governor in the state of Michigan said you can't do outdoor construction because of COVID. Um, just a lot of things were very difficult, but we really have these big problems with port congestions and process. And so we broke the supply chain. And so now you can't get goods and everyone has money. So everyone's willing to pay more for goods. So that's Charlie's two-step tr process to get inflation. And with that, Craig, could you explain to everyone what this chart means? I'm, I'm confused by it because I see a 7% in inflation. In it. That can't be right in the United States of America. Well, uh, the 7% is a real number. Right. It's the uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics Statistics have put out the uh, 7% as being an overall core inflationary index. And if we kind of look at that and compare it to the blue line, which is the core, which kind of strips out the cost of energy, the cost of food, and it's at a five and a half still a very healthy level of inflation that we're experiencing there. No two ways about it. I uh, kind of sticker shocked and uh, just because of things happening at our household, I've uh, been doing a little bit more shopping and grocery shopping and I was just kind of floored with what it would cost to take some stuff. So now we're kind of shifting our budget a little bit and kind of, you know, bringing down what we're actually eating a little bit more wonder bread, if you will. <laughs> So, so less beef and more pork, and that might be a little foreshadowing to a slide coming up here. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So we are experiencing that inflation. And then one of the uh, feds really they like to look at is the personal consumption expenditure, which is kind of a, uh, it's not a fixed. They do adjust that based on what's happening in the economy. And they say is kind of more of a true measure of the inflation that hits a household's income statements or balance sheets. And at 468, it's a healthy number there. And there's no two ways you can see since 2020, we've been experiencing that inflationary number. And this is one of those catalysts that is causing everybody to think the Fed should be raising interest rates is because the inflation that we're experiencing. You know, inflation, to, to put my rose colored half full glasses on for a minute, inflation is also a good thing. What we did learn back in the housing crisis, is deflation is bad. When you lend me money to buy a $100,000 house and it's worth $50,000 and I walk away from it, we call that bad. Here, if I buy a $100,000 house and it's worth $120,000, if I walk away from it, you're not losing money in that loan. And so there are a lot of positives that do come along with inflation and a reduced loan loss reserve for the foreseeable future is going to be one of those components I would expect from this also. Ah, so that's what's going to be one of the many saviors of earnings for this upcoming year is reversals. I like that. Yep, it's positive. <laughs> um, it is a big number inflation, and I wanted to have some fun here. And I have two graphs. The, the top graph is the Fed funds rate. And so we're looking at the Fed funds rate over a, a long period of time. And this back here is the 80s. It goes all the way back to 1960. Um, remember the 80s, uh, Jimmy Carter, Billy Beer, Volcker, breaking inflation, 22% um, in Fed funds. And then we've come down this, this nice drift all the way down for all these years to where we are today. Um, the bottom chart is the consumer price index, uh, X food and energy. And so having some fun, I, I looked at this and said, you know, where, where we are now uh, in the five and a half percent range, uh, we just came in 5% range and, and the consumer price index, when's the last time we hit there? You've got to go back to 1990 and we follow the red line here to, to 1990. And, and just for, for fun purposes, I, I ran that straight up to the Fed funds and said, well, at this point, Fed funds rate, when we hit this level of inflation, was in the neighborhood of 6%. So Charlie Math says here that Fed funds should be 6%. What do you think? 
I think we need to change the battery in your calculator is what I'm kind of thinking. <laughs> <laughs> but there is some truth into trending and see where the correlations are. You know, uh, you kind of see where, where our spike is right now. It's a little steep to call it a trend in mind. It seems like you mentioned something really smart statement earlier is, is what's the latest and greatest. So let's react to it right away as opposed right. to seeing the trend for information. Uh, there are some signs in the market to say, hey, there should be a little bit different uh, interest rate environment than we currently have. Uh, I don't know if it's got legs, if it's going to stick around for a long period of time. That's where I kind of like put a little uh, grain of salt. But I love the correlation that you have here. Absolutely. Yeah. And having some fun with that. You know, we, we were been in this downward trend. And as we look at you know, inflation, um, did trend down a little bit over that time frame. We looked from 1990 to 2000. Um, but at the same point, the Fed funds rate didn't react well at all. And it was an, a little bit of a different world. Then we get into the post 2000 and we really see the Fed funds rate being more intuitive to, to the economy, to the world, and, and more in tune with big activities such as the financial crisis in the year 2000. We come back and look at some of the recessions. And that came down to my comment, too. When you have a tendency of seeing the Fed raise rates, you do tend with a recession thereafter. So I don't think we're, we're in recession predicting mode yet here. Um, but I, I do think this does say that the Fed could raise rates. Maybe they don't raise them more than a, uh, you know 1% this next year, 1% thereafter. We can see the trend of consistently lower and lower highs in the Fed funds rate. And I, I would expect that that trend will continue. Do you agree with that? Yeah, yeah, fair statement. Absolutely. Well, another fun fact on uh, inflation here, um, this was really interesting too. And, and looking at, um, this is pure CPI, not, not X food and energy like we looked at, but you know, the last time where this high was back in 82 and, and Volcker tried to crush by raising up to 22% on in interest rates. I don't think we're going to get there. Um, you know, COVID is causing a lot of logistical and transportation problems, which is causing a bunch of this inflation. And this is something where, as Craig's comment, I do, need I do need new batteries in my calculator, I love, it is a different context. And this is where inflation was caused a lot back in the 80s, just by pure demand. And here we're looking at there's demand, but there's a lot of logistical issues and transportation problems. Building a house right now, it's really good until you try to put gutters up or a garage door on. And so those are the things that people are willing to pay a lot more for because they needed to complete a project. And that is some of the inflation. Um, we'd expect logistics to improve as time goes by, prices to fall, um, but wage-based inflation is going to stick around, and, and we do have some slides on that, um, and that's going to be tough, especially the, the smaller workforce, which we'll touch on that, but in the end, a lot of inflation is limited to a few things. Auto, when you don't have chips, as we go back to that conversation, you can't build cars. Uh, we'll talk about car deliveries, but auto values are up 37%, not a sustainable number. And then furniture is up about 17%, which is not sustainable. But, but that's the, the number of people moving houses and logistical problems. Um, food prices, talking to a, a farmer to spend about $2,000 to two to $3,000 to ship a load of strawberries from California to Michigan. And now they're talking about twenty twenty one thousand dollars $21,000 for that same truckload of strawberries. So that is a logistical problem, not the cost of the strawberries. So a lot of that should get fixed. Yeah, I like this chart as well, Charlie. And one of the things that uh, I was reading up on and found extremely interesting, and I'm sure a lot of our listeners will as well, is that the used car auto market. And we're going to look at it a little bit late in a little bit, but from an inflationary standpoint, the the government is attributing a full one percent of our inflation right now based on the used car market, which is interesting. And over the last two decades, the used car market uh, change in value is attributed to 0%. So this is, that's a real number, that number six item on this list of that huge up year over year and how it's attributing to inflationary numbers. Yeah, it definitely is. It, it is interesting. Um, a lot of, a lot of built up inflation um, and gas prices should be on here too, limit the space. But well, speaking of, of uh, driving, flying, is I know one of the favorite pastimes of this country, and occasionally pigs do fly, right? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Especially if you watch Animal House and you're in the cafeteria. <laughs> <laughs> Food fight! Sorry. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, but So when pigs fly, pork costs up 14% this year, and, and that's why buying more pork and less beef, because beef is up 20%. Um, a lot of this goes down to shipping, 
but also supply and demand problems going back to when demand fell apart and also the shifts of demand to supermarkets versus restaurants. So you got a lot of moving parts here. Um, but, you know, beef's the worst here, chicken, 8%, almost 9%, fish and seafood, 11%, eggs, 11, almost 12%, just some, some big increases here. Yep. Love the analogy. Inflation seems to be here, and uh, we can't strip out the food and energy number because it affects every single one of us in all our households. And, and the point here, I, I think I'd want to drive home with that, and I appreciate you saying it that way, Craig, is, you know, when I drive home from work, I pick up dinner and I put gas in my car. And so even though we focus on inflation, X food and energy, those expenses come across as a tax to me effectively because I have to buy food and I have to put gas in my car. So these higher prices and things like this will actually slow the economy a little bit as they continue. So this is part of why, you know, getting to your projections here, um, you know, we'll talk about this, but we're looking at CPI coming back down X food and energy to what, what number is that? Uh, three and a half percent, what we're expecting to in the first part of 2022. And then actually, we're expecting, you'll see our predictions a little bit continued downward uh, trend on it. Still above long term targets for the Fed. So still there, uh, higher than and, uh, than ideal, but 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 de decelerating. Yeah, and I, I appreciate that comment. And, and again, thinking about this from from your standpoint, as you go back to your, your institution and think about this businesses that you deal with that you may lend money to and individuals that work at those businesses should continue to do well as people have enough money to pay the higher prices now as wage-based inflation has been strong. So we shouldn't see a boost of earnings across the board. So I would expect that we, we continue to see a good economic environment for most businesses. And um, I, I think here, these are positive things. Uh, if we get to really high inflation, we continue at a 20% year over year uh, for a couple of years, we'll see people not buying as much steak. Um, but I, I do think that this is going to continue. Now, before we leave inflation, such a big thing, uh, Craig, I do have a quick question that's been uh, posed to me that I'd like to ask you. Um, what portion of the headline inflation is attributed, attributable to the logistics issue? And what portion is demand? That's a great, tough question. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Because there is demand. There's no two ways about it. There's lots of demand. And we've been training our consumers in the U.S. to spend money, quite frankly, with all that uh, liquidity and um, free money we've been giving out. I think there's a big component, though, that is from logistics. And um, it, it depends on the industry, quite frankly. You mentioned, you know, the chips and the autos, which is naturally causing supply issues. But then all of a sudden you get into some other things of workers and port backups and shipping. And I think there's a big, big, big uh, impact from the logistics side of things causing these infla uh, inflationary numbers, which are all fixable, by the way. They are, well, I can't say all, but uh, they're mostly fixable things. And that's why we're seeing, we expect a little bit of lower uh, uh, inflation number than we're seeing right now at the end of this year. Yeah. That's, uh, that's, a, that's a tough question. It really is. But I, I'm trying to calculate how many boxes of strawberries fit in a semi. So I can calculate what percentage increase that was. And, you know, my carton of strawberries is three or $4. Um, it, it becomes very interesting. And uh, I agree with you. I think logistics is going to be a substantial component uh, to come up with a number. I'm going to take a, a super guess, but I bet it's 50%. I'm going to put that out there as my guess today. Oh, that's, a, that's a high number, but it's a reasonable number of what's happening there. And, you know, one of the other things since we're talking about inflation, because it is on the minds of everybody and all of our listeners is, is, you know, what are actions that are expected to help moderate or at least manage this inflation number for the 2022. And, you know, we got to look towards the, the Fed right now. You know, they're going to be looking at quantitative tightening, right? Not right. easing. The story has been easing for a while. Now we're looking at tightening, rate increases, uh, balance sheet runoff. You know, those are things that are going to put liquidity or take liquidity out of the marketplace. Um, there, you know, one of the things that we do need to actually have one of the bigger challenges when, when I mentioned most will be able very much doable, but creating an environment that's inviting for that was that 55 plus year olds to go back into the work environment, right? So there's a mm -hmm. lot of X-Wing. Um, and then the last thing is, is their actions 
you know, that they're going to be doing the quantitative tidying or whatnot is going to have a change in direction or at least change in appreciation of assets because wealth creation in our country has been being created through appreciation with this these actions we expect that appreciation to slow uh, and in some cases potentially erode which will bring down anticipated inflationary pressures and worries yeah, that's a really good point and a great foreshadowing to our, our next section on, on the stock market and then you know, I do think, as you said, inflation, I think inflation has been good and we needed some inflation. We were low inflation for a number of years. We just need it now not to continue at 7% and, and tame back down to three and a half. So I, I, the, the, we'll see what happens here, but it'll be interesting. Now, I'm not going to give you the titles, but one is the S&P 500 and the other one's the NASDAQ. Can you tell the difference? Um, of course not. Uh, you know, this is what happens when you apply money to the system when you throw buckets of money at uh, an economy and a market and people and, and plus if you lock them down and give them money they become day traders um, stock market both are really high is there time for a correction you know uh, as long as earnings go up things should be good um, the key though is earnings and, and where earnings go and, and how much things happen and we are seeing people begin to put uh, credit card debt on which means maybe they've gone through some of their savings and they're starting to dip into you know borrowings to, to spend so maybe it doesn't continue like it has. Um, but one of the things with this, um, you know, 10 million new online brokerage accounts were you opened and are actively being used in 2020. Uh, we've created, and then now into 2021, it's even more, we don't have the data yet for 2021, but we've created a whole generation of investors. And talk about, you know, people that I'll maybe have some additional uh, saved up money so they can't go bad. Uh, they won't go bad on their... Um, uh, economic update. Um, hey, Dave, uh, you just hopped in the wrong way. We got to kick you out of there. So um, we'll take care of that. All right. Uh, just a quick comment on the stock market because it impacts so many things. I really think 2021 was really impacted by, you know, wealth creation and whatnot, but higher rates higher interest rates in general, and this goes back, Charlie, to your correlation thing of, you know, where Fed funds are, where rates are, um, higher interest rates usually have an impact on corporate profits. Spending sometimes does slow in higher rates, and there's a little bit of less borrowing going on. And so we as an industry need to be, be really mindful of that and be creative. And you're going to talk a lot about lending there. But as all the these uh, newly found experts in the trading market of these new 10 million retail online, we got to be careful because there won't, in my opinion, be a huge stock market correction this year. But there will be in certain industries, you know, with higher rates, you know, your growth stocks, you know, tech, if you were with really high PEs, those are going to be coming down some. But your value stocks will do much better or not as bad, <laughs> if that's the right way. I, so I like not as bad. Yeah, yeah, not as bad. So the value stocks. Stocks, and I think those growth and tax will get hit uh, quite a bit more with higher interest rates. There's been a positive correlation for years with that stuff. So be careful, everybody. Yes, yeah, so we got a little bit of rotation coming. Yeah. Uh, speaking of rotating, uh, as we get into housing, this is quite a good one. Um, speaking of inflation here, one bedroom apartment rent was up 12% in 2021 and two bedroom apartment rent up 13% in 2021. Um, you know, we're, we're seeing some, some strong housing demand. Um, it's interesting to me with, with housing here and, and you know, the, the eviction moratoriums are done and, you know, there may be some local things happening for eviction with, with COVID. But to me, it's really interesting. Our population's not growing very quickly. So uh, we have people repositioning to different houses, maybe with a home office, uh, maybe a pool in the backyard for more of a, a getaway feeling. Um, maybe we have millennials moving out of their parents' basements, as people I know would say, hopefully for that. Um, but we're, we're seeing some modifications, um, but not huge growth in, in number of people in our country. And so as I look at uh, some of these home sales numbers, it's, it's kind of like about time we got back up here with new home construction. We were lagging for a really long time, um, but it's interesting. And, and this is a real positive, I think, for everyone on the call here. Home values are up substantially. So if you've lent Charlie money on a home, the home is worth more. Um, I probably don't want to refinance my three and a quarter our 2.75% 30-year fixed rate mortgage. So when I redo the kitchen or redo the bathroom, I'm going to want a, a home equity line of credit or a second mortgage. I'm not going to want to pay that off. So I do think there is going to be some opportunity in the space as people look to renovate versus move a little bit with value changes. 
Um, how, how do you feel about this, Craig? This is an interesting one to me, how fast that we've seen values change in the housing market. Oh, absolutely. I agree with you on this. It, it does create a fam- fabulous lending opportunity. I like to look at that 2019 dip right before 2020 and the uh, pandemic hits. But 19, we see that's we, we did have interest rates starting to tick up. And you can see that dip in the housing sales, how there is that correlation. And I think as we do go through this year with slightly higher interest rates, well, it's going to impact that market quite a bit. And we're going to have to look towards, like you say, people staying in place, updating their homes, getting the home equity loans done. Great opportunity there for, for all of us to be lending there. Yep, and it's it's uh, in the value graph in the bottom. It's good to see if you go back to year two thousand at a hundred, and here we are in a lot of states. We'll call it the, the median in the country up to two, you know, two hundred ish. You know, we, we've doubled in value over twenty years, um, so up fifty percent in ten years or five percent a year. It's not a bad not a bad number. Um, so it seems to be fairly reasonable. Uh, we do have a lot of people that have been in their homes for a long time. And so this graph shows that we're talking about 25% of Americans have been in their homes for longer than 20 years. So there is a lot of pent up demand of people moving. And that's what we're seeing. We're seeing all this. I can't move because of COVID. I can't move because my home's underwater. Now we're above water and people aren't really caring about COVID. Things are, are getting back to even better than normal with the housing market. So it's been a good recovery. Um, so with that, maybe one other comment here on, on um, homes, you know, home sales are, are doing good. I don't think I need to read these numbers. Uh, things are going really well and selling fast. It's definitely a seller's market. And as Craig said, I think that stays in place uh, until interest rates go up a little bit. And then we'll see a little bit of it go to a neutral market, then maybe to a buyer's market. Um, but it, 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 I don't see a big drop in values. Do you see a, a big drop in values coming, Craig? No, not a bit, but there might be here in certain uh, metropolitan areas where, you know, there is more volatility demonstrated there than others. But overall, the general theme will be slow up of growth in the re- in the uh, housing market without a big decline at all. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, something near and dear to our heart in uh, Detroit, but also near and dear to the heart of, of uh, a lot of people doing lending in the space. Um, I, I do think supply and demand is neat. And going back to that question about how much of this is logistical from an inflationary standpoint. And I love the time to turn inventory, which was, was up and when immediately when COVID hit and auto dealers had to be closed, they couldn't be open. It went from about an 80 day turnover to a hundred day turnover. And then it fell off the cliff uh, as you, you still struggle. Like General Motors will not take orders on a number of their cars still right now, number of their trucks right now. We're all the way down to about a 20-day inventory turn. So amazing. Uh, car dealers tell me it's really three. Uh, three days, by the time they get the, the cars and unload them off the truck, and three days are all picked up by whoever bought them. Uh, so not, not a lot of extra inventory, which has really pushed those numbers up. Yeah, and Ted, that mentioned earlier about used car prices uh, going up and having that impact on inflation. The interesting, just little tidback, December uh, was all-time high on average used car prices, hit 28000 It's the highest it's ever been for average cost there, which is about a 25% year-over-year increase on those values. Um, I, it is an issue that's going to be worked through uh, go, coming up over the next few quarters on uh, supply issues. And, and something that's going to be interesting here, uh, we look at the price of gasoline on the bottom. We're up to you know about three and a half dollars a gallon now, uh, up dramatically from, from where we were pre, pre-COVID, even in the, the, you know, the two and a half dollar range. Um, so it is a su- substantial increase in, in the cost of gasoline, and, and that will be detrimental to the economy. And the same thing with oil. There's a lot of people predicting, you know, we're hitting hundred dollars a barrel, just when, not if. Uh, and a lot of that is domestic production really got hurt, um, not be political, but our, our current administration does not like domestic oil production. They've made that clear. And, and so we're going to continue to see this go back up, which I, I hate to see that personally, um, but it's a, it's a tough spot here. Yeah, there's some consequences for higher oil prices, you know, less travel actually because of the cost to travel a little bit, even though that's where people are going to, disposable income lower, higher, less, less volume on higher margin vehicles, meaning gas guzzlers, right? But right. You know, the positive, let's go there, is is it's good for the EV market, which, you know, a lot of people are pushing into that foray of electric vehicles. So it should be positive in that, in that respect. 
Well, hopefully there'll be a lot of employment in digging for minerals to uh, make batteries. Uh, and, you know, that's always the fun argument of where the, where the minerals come from uh, in the EV world. But uh, I do think employment is, is a huge component of, of, of this environment. And this is one that I get confused on. So I'm looking for your wisdom here. Um, obviously, we've had a lot of people leave the workforce. And uh, we see a lot of working mothers have left the workforce. A lot of uh, baby boomers that were close to retirement said, hey, look, I'm done. My, my retirement portfolio really went up. And, but we dropped from a 63, you know, 63.5% labor force participation rate all the way down to you know, pretty quick to and averaged out around 61 and a half, close to 62. That That's a big change right there. It's absolutely a tremendous number there, something that we haven't really experienced. And, you know, there is some industries that are alluding to or uh, going towards uh, causing this number to be low on the participation rate. I mentioned that earlier as a accommodative environment for 55 plus people, but then you look at job quits and it was really um, weighted towards um, restaurants and healthcare workers where 3% in November, 3%, that's the latest numbers available of the workforce of all workforces, 3% quit. You know, that's, that's a big number. That's telling us that there's a problem that needs to be fixed. Uh, But we're near all time highs uh, in job openings going on right now. And it's, it's, it's interesting. We're all-time highs in job openings, yet here we are, length of unemployment staying around 30 weeks. So that's always an interesting one to me. Um, if you don't want to work, I guess you don't have to. But um, we, we are back down to pre-pandemic levels of unemployment and, and probably really lower than that uh, by the time you take all the people that don't want to work out of the equation. So this is going to be a challenge. It's going to push people to work harder on technology, um, but it's going to be a challenge for the next couple of years. But with that, thinking about employment, the consumer had this huge burst of income that came in. And we look at the personal savings rate. I can't believe this. It got almost all the way up to 35% uh, with all the government stimulus checks coming out. Um, but those stimulus checks have stopped. The PPP funds have stopped. Everything stopped. And so we're actually seeing uh, the savings rate come back to a, still a pretty good level, about you know 6 7% here. Uh, do you see this level continuing? Uh, should we see cash going out of our, our investment portfolios? What do you see here, Craig? Well, I, I, one comment about, you know, that spike, it's on, it's almost like, you can, I don't know if everybody on this call is old enough to remember the ice cream trucks that would go around the neighborhoods playing the music that would cause somebody to become an ax murderer. But <laughs> as they're basically giving, you know, giving away money along with your uh, ice cream cone as it was going. And so that's what really drove that. The United States, we're not great savers. You know, we're not, you know, we're never really in that top 10 or if we are, it's usually seven, eight or nine and developed countries as a savings rate. Uh, the correlation I like to think about, though, is, is inflation and the savings rates, because we know inflation erodes the value of cash, right? So we'll talk about cash later. But um, it, I don't think it's going to have a positive correlation on the savings rate as we go forward through 2022. And I think it's going to continue to stick at this level, maybe slightly lower as things as we do have a trailing inflation through this year, as it, that nicks away at disposable income for people. Yeah. Well, it's going to be interesting. I do think we're going to get a little bit of modifications. Um, we have this chart here about delinquency, and, and the short version is no one's delinquent on loans right now, and we don't see that changing. So yeah. the result of all this, um, going back almost a duplicate of that last slide that Craig was talking about, the income slide, income is up, and that's what the green line is here. And you can see the bumps up that came with, with all the, the activity with uh, the COVID stimulus checks. Um, that is good for, for our businesses because what's going to happen is people have money, people have money to spend, they have, they have money to save, and they're going to do activities. And they also have greater income to borrow. And then we look at the, the, the debt to disposable income, the blue line here, people have a great capacity to borrow. And this is why I do have great hope for a lot of the institutions on this call here today and our future. People can borrow money. They can afford to borrow money. And that's really going to help out our balance sheets as we grow loans here over the next couple of years. It's, listen, we had five years of deposit growth. Now we're going to take about five years to get that loan growth to catch, catch back up here. Um, with that, Craig, this, this graph here, it, it looks like um, the patient was laying on the table dead, then got a heartbeat. What, what can you tell me here? <laughs> Healthcare workers, we really need them. <laughs> <laughs> 
GDP is doing well. You know, you kind of look at, forget the big spikes. We know it was happening there with the recovery from the pandemic and uh, just year over year comparisons. Uh, but you kind of look at uh, afterwards, the 2021, once we get past that critical stage and, you know, somewhere at a 5% GDP growth, that's fabulous. It's come back down to a 2.3. Uh, and I, we don't, I don't expect things to go negative, but I do think we're going to have a continued economic expansion through 2022. And it's going to be great for causing opportunities for everybody to, to what, what you, like you said, is lend into this market with the growth that we do experience. It's not going to be home run numbers for GDP growth this year, at, you know, where its average is going to be north of five. It'll be sub five for the year, uh, but it's still going to be positive, which is great. Yeah, it's good to see. We, we, we've really improved the economic growth from back where we've been with the volatility. It's been consistently positive for a number of years, and, and except for obviously the, the COVID spike down and Hopefully we'll continue that at a better positive rate. So, and that's good for everyone thinking here on the call, growth of, of business, growth of activity in, in the country is good because that's going to be increase more growth for loans. And to me, I really think that's a positive here and something we should make sure we're thinking about as we go forward. So with that, um, Craig, you've got some great projections here for um, interest rates and a number of things here for the year of 2022. You just highlight a few of your, your projections here for us. One that's on everybody's mind, Charlie, is the Fed funds rate, the overnight borrowing rate. You can see when we put this together, it's put in three rate hikes, uh, potential, it's 50-50. You and I actually remember we uh, arm wrestled and you won, so we left it at this number. Otherwise, it would have been 125 by the end of 22, 2022. So interesting there. Uh, this, the, the belly of the curve is interesting where we're just seeing the expected the five year to come up to around that 2% level. And then the flattening of that yield curve where you can see that 10 year right below that at a two and a quarter. And we're getting there pretty quick right now. Uh, but once again, we're gonna have these governmental programs and actions that should moderate some, any kind of further increases as we see some changes in our GDP. You can see that GDP second to row bottom, Big number, 6.3%. First quarter, we're expecting five. But still, as you can see, positive growth for our economy, but at a decelerating rate. And inflation as well. Uh, you know, we've got you know historical high inflationary numbers right now. We expect them to moderate as we fix some things in our economy and the supply chain that we talked about earlier as well. Yeah, I think it's a fair point. And so what I'll take from this, everyone here, is that rates are coming up. They're not skyrocketing. They're, they're not shooting up to 5% overnight. We do think they're going to gradually go up to 1%, maybe one and a quarter, as, as Craig said, uh, this year. And next year, maybe they go up another half percent, percent, and, and we'll, we'll continue to monitor. But we're not looking at spikes because of all of the uncertainty, both geopolitical and, and locally, um, to keep things moderated. Um, a quick question, just to take a step back, a slide here. Uh, a question came in is, does the employment participation rate include self-employed workers? I wonder if more Americans are finding self-employment as a viable option to support their family. And self-employed workers, legally self-employed, meaning paying business taxes, are going to be included. But if you're getting paid by Venmo, uh, it's not going to be included if you're not filing tax returns or incorporating as a business, which a lot of people ask, why is the government looking at trying to get reporting of Venmo traction, transactions over a certain dollar amount? it's to track these hidden businesses. And so I do think there is a number of people uh, to answer the question that was posed to us that are flying under the radar by not being a, a true business and being a cash business today. And believe it or not, Venmo's made being a cash business easier uh, than it was historically. All right, from there, um, wanna hop into and talk about some uh, profitability and growth in, in, in 2022. And um, we have some, some just kind of a big, big points here to talk about. And um, this is going to unfortunately come slowly, but we'll start off with interest rate risk management. And uh, I think as, as Craig has pointed out here with his interest rate projections, rates are changing. If there's ever a day to look at your plus 100 on your ALM report and, and think about what does it do? And also think about how you're going to react. How are you going to change your deposit rates? How did you say you would in the model? How are you thinking about doing it? Those are really important things to pay attention to today and good planning is extremely important. Um, from there, you know, once you've got your ALM done and running well, 
you need to think about correctly investing with the best investment strategy possible. Craig, can you can you add a little bit to this? No, we lost your audio somehow there. Um, so see if we get you back. But the how about now? Got it. You're good. But I had something on interest rate risk management. We're going to move forward on this. Oh. Um, for correctly investing with best in, and that was operator error, just so you guys all know. <laughs> <laughs> and that wasn't the technology. It, it wasn't me muting you this time. <laughs> You know, over the last couple of decades, uh, we've always stayed fully invested, fully invested. And that's not necessarily what we mean here, is we mean to be investing for your balance sheet, you know, looking at your interest rate risk management. Where can we effectively manage interest rate, not eliminate through the investment portfolio? And if we can go longer with duration, uh, you know, let's do that. Make sure that it really matches your expectations on liquidity, need for earnings, and your interest rate risk environment, in, uh, interest rate risk position. And then create that investment strategy. Strategy, and we everybody needs to make sure you're rethinking and just readdressing what your strategy is today and how it should change going in through 2022 into 2023. Extremely important because we want to make sure we're maximizing our earnings in that uh, extremely important asset class. Yeah, that's something to think positively. Higher interest rates and in being invested the correct duration and, and having the money out actively working for you. We're going to make more money, so it's going to be a better year next year. Yeah. A couple other things with, with people that can do alternative portfolios, uh, it's a great spot to get additional earnings to keep up with inflation. Um, I think an, an alternative portfolio is one of the best things you can do in the credit union space today. And and then bully in, in the bank space and or in the, Coley in the credit union space. Uh, that's a great thing to do to really focus on making sure you're covering some of your benefit expenses. The other thing, um, Craig, you talked about was limiting cash on your balance sheet, which is different than what we just talked about. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, as opposed to just identifying where are we not investing in, you know, different asset classes, we're looking at the credit profiles and where are the spreads, which should widen coming in through 2022, we'll see uh, some widening in spreads, is, you know, what are we doing with our cash and why do we have so much or why do we have so little? you really got to take a look at it going into this rate environment because, it, this we've all been at this a long time, and the standard his, history has proven when rates go up, cash dwindles a little bit, and people back off of reinvesting into their balance sheet, whether it's lending or investments. And then rates drop back down, liquidity comes back, and we're reinvesting back in the lower rate environment. We want to make sure we don't do that. We want to limit cash, stay invested, and um, continue to book in these higher earning uh, interest rate environment. Yeah, it's a really, really good point. And, um, you know, we are, we've had a tough year with margin. And the last couple of years have been really tough with margin. I see margin expansion coming right now. I'm really excited about that. And uh, so that's the positive. I think what's going to be a little bit difficult, though, is some of the, the issues here with uh, non-interest income. If you've been living on mortgage revenue, that's, that's going away. Um, and we're going to see much lower gain on sale mortgages. But I do think looking at ways where you can get into other non-interest income activities is really going to be key in 2022. And, and people have a greater trust with their financial institutions every day. And so looking what else you can get into. Another area we're seeing some positives is debit and credit card optimization. If you have a debit credit card program, uh, that exchange, the, the, the fee income, exchange fee income is going to get bigger. More and more people continue to shop on Amazon and online in different ways. They're using their credit cards more and more. There's more of an income stream that come into play there too. A um, couple other things here, build a mortgage servicing portfolio. You know, if you're writing mortgage loans and selling them, not a bad idea to, uh, to build a mortgage servicing rights portfolio and work on actually cross-selling them, actively cross-selling and actually cross-selling, doing the right things. Um, that's an area to build value and to keep those relationships. So if we go back to a refinance time, you've got the relationship to refinance and get that gain on sale. If interest rates do turn down from some sort of economic downturn, you've got the ability to, to get more income that way. Um, this one's an interesting one. And, and Craig, I love your comments on this too, but I, I put uh, grow core deposits here. Uh, one of the things, obviously we all have more deposits than we want right now. But as we go into the future, to, to have more core deposits and not have to go down the path of borrowings or not have to go down the path of, of CDs, 
this could be a great way to really help your earnings and continue a strong margin as we go into 2022 and beyond. Yeah. Well said there, Charlie. And it is counterintuitive to what we see right now. But as we all look and meet with our ALCO committees and look for the next 12 to 36 months, if I'm wrong and we continue down this path of uh, the Fed raising rates, it's going to cause liquidity to, free, to shrink a little. Now is the time to be really looking at developing new core relationships where the core deposits come in. When their liquidity eventually dries up, they're going to be there for you as the primary lender for those lending needs as well. And it's going to be cheap money, core deposits as historically, and, and I can't say forever, but for, for, for the foreseeable future, be the lowest cost of funding source for all of us. Yeah, it's going to be really good. This is a tough one for me to say grow loans doesn't help a lot. We want to make sure you're getting a couple of good tidbits from us. Home equity lines of credit, second mortgages, um, boats, RVs. We're going to have people continuing to buy toys and rates are going to be higher. So we do think there's going to be a return to that and people are borrowing. Debit or credit card balances are rising back to almost pre-pandemic levels. And so we're going to see this continued spending. So that's going to help. We do have a unique opportunity today. Interest rates are very low in the bank space. We're seeing a ton of banks issue debt for capital, uh, sub debt out there, very, very favorable rates. In the credit union space, we're seeing secondary capital grow quite quickly. Um, today's a day. If you think your, your capitalization might not be strong enough for the next 10 years, it's probably a bit of a gift today, given where interest rates are and where people are willing to lend money. So one thing for profitability, a little bit more of a profitability planning, is ensure that your capitalization is correct on a go-forward basis today. Um, really, really good opportunity today. With that, our, our last but not least is implement CECL. Um, this is not an earnings thing, but it is an earnings management thing. Uh, CECL's coming fast, Jan 1, we're live on CECL. So we need to make sure that you, you're planning ahead, you're knowing what the impact is, and if that impact is gonna be big, maybe you have time to argue that impact and to explain why it's not should not be as big, but you wanna have the time prepared to be ready to go so you're not hit with a surprise number. You know, CECL, the change of your from your loan loss reserve account to CECL will be implemented. Now it's gonna be coming in over a few years, but that definitely will hurt your capitalization. So going back one slide, knowing your CECL effect today to ensure that you don't need to do anything, your capitalization is extremely important, or you may want to do something with your capitalization, bring in sub debt. All right. Uh, any comments on that, Craig, or I'm going to wrap stuff up here? Nope. Uh, he said it very well. Cool. Thank you very much. Well, with that, I'd like to thank you, Craig, uh, for, for spending some time with me today. We're really excited. I've enjoyed our conversation. I'm excited for the future. I think there's some great things happening, and uh, I expect that we're going to see earnings actually improve this next year uh, with margin, uh, maybe a little bit lower in non-interest income, um, but I do think margin is going to be coming back quite a bit. And one of the components to earnings in the credit union space is our next webinar coming up on, on February 9th. Uh, Craig and I will be chatting again, talking about uh, employee benefit prefunding accounts and charitable donation accounts, looking at ways so we can beat the rate of inflation and we can beat the increase of cost of employee benefits. And really excited about that and also look at ways to continue to enhance your social mission with charitable donation accounts. Uh, so with that, Craig, I want to thank you very much. I appreciate your help. Thank you, Charlie. I appreciate it. Enjoyed the time. And thank you to all our participants as well. Yeah, again, thank you for everyone for joining us. I hope everyone has a wonderful day as we reach the end of the hour here. And uh, everyone have a, a wonderful rest of your week. Thank you.